following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Carmen, welcome back to the studio. Hello, I'm so glad to be back. I'm so glad to have you back. The last time you were here and visited with us, we talked about Library Dragon and we talked about growing up Cuban in Decatur, Georgia. Yes. What was it, how did it affect your stories and your writing to, to grow up in a Spanish-speaking household mm -hmm. in a very small southern town? Well, you know, it's almost, it could be Vietnamese in Topeka, mm -hmm. Kansas. I mean, it's, um, mm -hmm. anytime that you have more than one culture influencing you, one of the things that I think it does is it makes it impossible to ever see the world from just one perspective. It's, it, mm -hmm. you can't. You have not just met the other, you've been the other. And you, if you're a child, and many mm -hmm. children who are bicultural and bilingual mm -hmm. know this, they have to be sort of the ambassadors. They have to interpret the world for their parents, mm -hmm. and they have to interpret their parents to the world, for, in, well, at least in which they live. Mm -hmm. well, so I think it was very helpful. Well, as a, a young ambassador, you were also a young storyteller, and you brought along with you something that, from that time, talk to us about who this friend is and this why he's so important to you. Is my bear. No one's ever seen him outside of my family. It took some coaxing. He got his own seat on the plane. <laughs> this Packaged bear, carefully, I'm yes, sure. Oh, pa yes, he yes. was. Uh, my bear is um, was came in a refugee package. We were sponsored by a church in Decatur, Georgia, and one of the things we would get regularly were, were bundles of mm -hmm. clothes and mm -hmm. household items, and this bear was in one of them, and he became my my just my constant companion, and he was um, sort of he was my introduction to s animals as sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And for children who don't know what that word means, it means something that's sentient is aware and alive. And the reason was because my sister would speak for him. And she, oh, oh yeah. Most of the time she was incredibly sweet. Sometimes she, she was mad at me. She would go, oh, he wants to sleep with me tonight. I'm so sorry. <laughs> she was an older sister. <laughs> older sister. Uh <-huh. laughs> She's actually wonderful and was yeah, my first storyteller. Yeah. So I was happy to bring Kofita today. Well, I'm glad to have him on the set with us today. Thank you. Can a storyteller be a writer? Can a writer be a storyteller? How are they the same? How are they different? Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think for a reader, and mm -hmm. I'm speaking as a reader as much as a writer, mm -hmm. I'm looking for wonderful language. In other words, a book that isn't just, isn't thrown together. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's been a great deal of care taken into the language, the wording, the grammar, the spelling, the punctuation, the parsing. Kids, you cannot go to sleep during this part. This matters because if you're trying to tell a great story, mm -hmm. but you're not using good language, you're interrupting the flow of the story. Mm -hmm. And by the same token, you need a powerful story, a compelling story, a story that makes the reader want to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so each one services the other. And I think without the dovetailing of you know, wonderful language and a killer story, you have something that's only gonna be almost as, much, as good as you want it to be. And I'm not certainly not saying we've achieved that. Um, with this book or any book, but that's the goal. You're watching Meet the Author. Today's guest is Carmen Agraditi. Perhaps you have heard her stories on public radio about growing up Cuban in Decatur, Georgia. Some of her storybooks include 14 Cows for America and Martina the Beautiful Cockroach. Carmen, how did your storytelling skills influence your latest book, The Cheshire Cheese Cat, co-written by Randall Wright. This book is very different from other books that you've written in the past. Well, it's certainly longer. <laughs> <laughs> it's my first foray into middle grade. Mm -hmm. And I've been telling stories to children mm -hmm. for 22 years. And when I visit schools as an author, I come as a picture book author. I've written eight picture mm -hmm. books. And uh, I love telling stories to children. It's what I probably enjoy or have for many years enjoyed the most. How did it influence it? Um, the idea that a story requires a really strong narrative arc. Mm -hmm. And for the children, the arc mean, of the story means where does it be, where's its beginning, where's its middle, and where does it climax, where's, mm -hmm. where does it, everything come to a head, and then how do you close it, where's your end? And I know the girls and boys in school hear all the time about beginning, middle, end, beginning, middle, end, mm -hmm. we drill it into them. But that is fundamental story structure. And I think understanding story is a really important part of writing, whether you're writing a 32-page picture book, mm -hmm. or in this case, a novel. The wonderful thing about this is that suddenly there was so much room. And uh, working with Randall was fabulous. 
because mm -hmm. he had written already a, uh, two or three novels. Mm -hmm. And um, so he kept saying, just let it go. You have room. You have literary largesse. Well, tell us, what is the book about and why the Victorian setting? That's a little bit different, too. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a history buff anyway, and most children wouldn't, well, you wouldn't necessarily know that. But, um, and World War II and the 19th century are two of my favorite. Mm -hmm. Most history buffs have an era. And I happened to be in London in uh, 2002 with my daughters when I ran into an inn. I didn't literally run into the inn, but almost because it was foggy. Mm -hmm. We saw golden light through the mist coming off the Thames on a, on a particularly eerie London night. And one of the, my daughters said, uh, look. Of course, we all turned, and there was this <laughs> squeaky sign made of wrought iron and glass, mm -hmm. and it said, Ye Old Cheshire Cheese, rebuilt 1667. And we thought, we are so there. Oh, yeah. We are so yeah. there. For one thing, we were all history buffs, and we knew the Great mm -hmm. Fire of London was mm -hmm. 1666, so this thing was probably there before that. It had just mm -hmm. been rebuilt, so who knew how? And it was amazing. And while we were there, we discovered an etching, a picture of cats hanging inside the inn. The inn was extraordinary all by itself. It was like the best Harry Potter set you could ever imagine. But this picture was of cats eating inside the old Cheshire cheese. And I had this idea, helped, my daughters helped me think of it actually. Um, what if one of the cats wasn't there for the mice that of course would come for the cheese? What if one of those cats had a terrible, shameful secret? He'd actually come because he was a secret cheese eater. Another email question, and this is from Sydney. <laughs> Uh, Cindy writes, I noticed that many of your books are about animals. Is there a reason why? I love them. I love animals. Um, I, and I, I don't just love them like they're some sweet, cuddly. I, I'm fascinated by them. I, um, Della, you and I had a little mm -hmm. bit of a conversation. Children, believe it or not, grown-ups talk even when we're off camera. And uh, we were talking about animals and the animals we've had mm -hmm. and own. And um, animals are more than just... Um, it, you know, the, the, sort of the stopping point in between um, human beings and flora. So you have mm -hmm. flowers, you have animals, and you have humans. Mm -hmm. uh, the, animals have an entire inner life. Many of them are problem solvers. They grieve. Some actually bury their dead. Some use tools. Um, we've discovered now that mm -hmm. there are animals, there's a man who's trained his dog to read over 100 words. So we're having to rethink mm -hmm. how we see animals. And I just find them in incredibly um, fascinating. Well, thanks, Sydney, for the email. What is the book about? What is at the heart of the story? I'm so glad you asked me that. Well, you know how you asked me about, is this an animal mm -hmm. story and why animals? Mm -hmm. Another reason why I really love animal stories is the reason that any storyteller, as far back as stories have been told in, to the mists of time, because we know that there are truths that we can hear and children can hear when they belong in the world of an of, an, of a mm -hmm. animal. For example, if an animal is being very selfish, we can say, "Oh, bad kitty." Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to hear it when someone mm -hmm. says, "You are being selfish." It's a story of friendship, and how friendship has nothing to do with your people, who you are, or mm -hmm. where you came from. Real friends recognize each other across a room, and it doesn't matter if it's a monk from Tibet and a, and a Waffle House waitress. They can lock eyes, start to talk, and realize they have been friends forever. And so that, to me, that was really important, that Pip and Skilly somehow, not easily, as you, mm -hmm. if you read the book, you'll see, because we tried to create a real story where people often disappoint and even betray each other. And that was hard to write, actually. I'm sure it was. Um, and the other thing, and I think for me this was at the very core, Skilly is a character that has a very hard time mm -hmm. acknowledging who he truly is. And whether you're a child or an adult, you'll never be a self-actualized person. You'll never be real until you're able to claim every part of yourself and come out into the world as whomever you are. They like it, they don't like it. Well, the book has only been out a short while, but Lily from Thomas Jefferson Middle School, she has read it, and we have an email question from her. Uh-oh. She writes, did Queen Victoria really have ravens in the Tower of London? And if so, were the ravens treated as royalty? Uh, yes. They, um, th they, well, yes and no. Yes, she mm -hmm. had the ravens. And um, they are actually in the military. 
the Ravens and Tower of London are, are, are conscripted. They are, they are, they have serial numbers. They can be dismissed. In fact, in I believe it was 1970, early 70s, one of the Ravens was dismissed because he was eating um, TV antennas, and his paperwork said uh, dismissed for behavior unbecoming. So he was sent off to Wales. I think that's where they send you when you misbehave. They don't tolerate any shenanigans in Wales, not that sort of thing. No, no eating, <laughs> no eating TV antennas. No misbehaved ravens. No, and there's even a raven, uh, there's a raven graveyard. When they die, there is an, a there's an actual, uh, I mean, there's, there's a service and they are, their name is, is added to the list of ravens mm -hmm. along on the, on the raven stone. Wow, I did not know that. Oh, there's some great raven stories. Oh my goodness. During World War II, when uh, the war was over and the blitz, the bombing of mm -hmm. London was over and the, 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 everyone climbed out of the rubble, I remember the legend says that if all the ravens are ever destroyed or leave the Tower of London, England will fall. When World War II ended, there was one raven left in the tower. His name was Grip, from whence, some people say, we get the term, get a grip. As an educator, I know students collaborate on projects with other students all the time. That's, yes. that's part of a normal day. What was it like to collaborate with your co-author, Randall Wright? It was wicked fun. It was, we adored it, and, and we didn't always agree. I mean, there were times mm -hmm. when it was down to the, mm -hmm. I would take a word out and he mm -hmm. would put it in, and I would take it out and he would put it in, or vice versa, or we'd say, I do not like the way this is going, I don't like this character, um, but, but we like each other a great mm -hmm. deal. We loved working together. We learned that collaboration is something that you create, but also has to have a, a, a certain amount of magic. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know if we had this. Neither one of us had ever collaborated with anyone. And we found that we, our sensibilities about books, about children, about the world were very similar. Mm -hmm. And our writing styles were, were not dissimilar. Mm -hmm. um, we just had to learn how to mesh them in the way, and you may ask, want to know later how I, we did that, and we will tell you in a little bit. Well, I'd, I'd talk to me about that now. And, and w an example of the collaboration, for instance, uh, the section on Maldwin, perhaps. Well, the, the, our original collab collaboration, mm -hmm. the way we, we set it up, the structure mm -hmm. was, one of us would write a chapter, mm -hmm. the other person would rewrite it, then hand it back and that first okay. person would rewrite it, then, then the other person would rewrite it, and we would go back and forth rewriting one chapter 20, 25 times until we had one voice. Almost giving in a new lens yes. and a new perspective. Okay. Now there were, there were certain characters that we sort of took on and um, more the voice of. And uh, Randall will be here in a little bit, and, and I think via Skype, so he can tell us. Um, I did a little more Pip. He did a little more Skilly. Mm -hmm. um, I did a little more Maldwin. Um, he he did La Thackeray. Um, uh, he did a, most of the Dickens. Mm -hmm. um, I I had uh, Clooms Adele. But then we would go in, and after we re you rewrite someone, you know, a dozen mm -hmm. times. It, it, there was a, a point at which we really just couldn't tell who had written what. Just become seamless. Well, we, we, we worked really hard. We were very diligent, and there were, yeah. but we loved it, and we had a great deal of research. I'm looking well. forward to talking to them. In the meantime, we're going to take a short break. Okay. And when we return, we'll have Randall Wright on the line. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Do not go away. We will love it. There are some wacky words in this book, The Cheddar Cheese Cat by Carmen Agarditi and Randall Wright. Let me know if you agree with me. I'll say the word and you guess the definition. Ready? Caterwauling. People from England say it this way. Caterwauling. Caterwauling means A, walking carefully, B, tickle, or C, whining. If you said C, you are correct. The authors use the word like this. Stop your miserable caterwauling. Here's another example. Mauser? Mauser? Mauser. Mauser means A, curious, B, a catcher of mice, or C, favorite cheese. Well, B is the right answer and the key of the story, the Cheshire Cheese Cat. I could ask you about Foofery, Moggy, and Blatherby. But here's the last word of my little quiz, gobsmacked. Does it mean A, full, B, hurt, or C, astonished? The, the answer is C. I'm just gobsmacked with all these weird words. 
Back to you, Della. I need to look up some more words. Well done. Welcome back. Before we went to break, I was talking to Carmen about collaboration. Sure. We have Randall Wright with us on the line, and I'd like to talk to Randall a little bit. Hi, Randall. Hi. What, tell us about how you approach the collaboration process with Carmen. What did you do differently? Well, it was uh, one of the different things was having somebody uh, to answer to, uh, somebody like Carmen who has such a, a good uh, 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 feeling for story. Uh, also, uh, my writing process is to simply sit down and start writing, and we uh, decided that we would write this book together, and uh, I took a trip to Atlanta to meet with Carmen for the first time to discuss the book while on the airplane I wrote the first chapter and uh, got off the airplane and uh, Carmen wasn't uh, wasn't very pleased that I had gone ahead and started uh, because she wanted to work on it too and but uh, that was a fortuitous thing in that it helped us develop our writing process that Carmen's already mentioned where one of us would write a chapter and give it to the other the uh, the other would revise it and it would go back and forth well that first chapter went back and forth uh, several times and during that first trip we wrote uh, three or so chapters that way and discovered our process um, one thing that it did for me as a writer uh, was to help me uh, visualize my process uh, uh, better and uh, and it improved my writing uh, quite a bit did you go back and forth on all of the chapters that way throughout the the length of the book? And did you do the chapters in sequence? Uh, yes, uh, we went. In fact, we went back and forth almost word by word uh, because we both have such uh, uh, a care and interest in language and mm -hmm. and and using the right word in the right place and developing the rhythm. Uh, it's not just words; it's sentence structure and, and sentence rhythm the right number of syllables, even though this isn't poetry, it still has to have a rhythm. And by going back and forth like that, uh, we were able to hone that rhythm. And that's one of the things that helped us establish this, the voice of the, of the book. Well, Katie McIntyre, she is an elementary school teacher from Bellevue Elementary. She emailed us with a question and she asked, how did you both come up with the names of your characters, especially Pinch? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember how we came up with Pinch. Uh, we a lot of the characters, uh, such as Maldwin. Maldwin was originally called Melville, uh, simply because that was the name we pulled out of a hat. Uh, but during research, we discovered that Maldwin should have a Welsh name because that's uh, how the Tower Ravens were, and so we came up with Maldwin. Mm -hmm. Maldwin. Uh, many of the names came from our love of Dickens. Uh, for example, Pip is a character in Great Expectations. Uh, no. Pinch, however, we were we just tried to think of a of a name that sounded vile, and uh, but but still that was printable, and uh, somehow Carmen, do you remember how we came up with Pinch? I'm, we had uh, another name for him for a long time. I don't remember, and then I remember just coming up. Would you know? Pinch just seemed like it doesn't sound horrible, but it just sounds small and uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I have a question for both of you. How did you organize your ideas and figure out who would do what in advance of the story? I know you've talked about the rhythm and you've talked about going back and forth. Was there a plan for organizing it or okay. did you just kind of go with the, the flow and the rhythm that you described? The, 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 well, you start with the frame, but the story mm -hmm. tells itself. And although I, I said, you know, I came back mm -hmm. with about a 17 page story arc. Mm -hmm. When he and I began to write that story, that story there were certain elements in that that remained the same, but Randall, you know, things happened all along the way, didn't they? I mean, where the story would suddenly start to go in a different direction, and we ended up in the same place in the end, which is we wanted a Proqua story. And this is why the, the doors of the Cheshire Cheese have never closed, and the mice are protected forever. But wonderful things happened, and Randall is a fabulous writer, and I feel that I feel just as he does that I became a better writer working with him. Um, the story may go in a certain direction, but a clear example was um, Randall was writing. And Randall, do you want to tell them this? Your, your, whatever shall we do with with Melville? Um, uh, Carmen, so for most of the part, uh, wrote the uh, chapters with Pip, 
I don't remember the exact sequence, but there was a chapter with Pip where he was trying to figure out what to do with this new cat in the inn, and and f for some reason I just wrote, but whatever shall we do with Melville, and gave it to Carmen. And, and said, I okay, said, your turn. Figure who's out Melville? Melville and he said, I don't know, figure it out. <laughs> Randall, talk to us. You also have a lot of old-time vocabulary, a lot of weird words. Talk to us a little bit about that and your, your, your selection of the words that you chose to use in the story. Well, we, we both love words, and we both love Dickens. I've, uh, I've read Dickens. Uh, started when I was little. My mother would read us a Christmas carol mm -hmm. at Christmas time. And uh, so I've read a lot of Dickens, and you can't help but when you read Dickens, come away mm -hmm. with a... A style uh, that's very similar. Uh, I I can't read Dickens while I'm writing one of my own works because it, it affects the style so much. Um, but we decided that we wanted to, this to be in in the voice of Charles Dickens mm -hmm. uh, or a similar voice, and so uh, we just began writing uh, and not concerned with the level of language and and difficulty of words. We would address that later because we wanted to capture the voice. And then, uh, so, Mar uh, Carmen is marvelous with, with words, and, uh, and she would uh, uh, develop these sentences and, and words and, and, uh, that, that just flowed so smoothly and so well and sounded so great. Words like sepulcher and, and uh, Stygian darkness. Uh, and then uh, we... We did that and then decided, well, this should be a middle grade, so we do need to, uh, uh, to pull back a little bit. We didn't want to dumb it down because we have a lot of confidence in our middle grade readers that, uh, that they can deal with uh, a lot of these words, but uh, we didn't want to make it uh, uh, a, a burden or a chore for them. And so we went through and uh, either removed or uh, defined in constant context words that uh, were higher level. And then uh, we added a glossary of those words that we just couldn't bear to part with. Yeah, I, I was thrilled to see that glossary. Talk to us about the word foofery. It's, it's fun to read, it's, it's, it's fun to pronounce, it's, uh, you, but why did you choose to use that one? <laughs> Listen to it, just how yeah, wonderful it sounds. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I, I think it came from, uh, from listening, uh, I don't know where I picked it up, it was probably watching uh, a Jane Austen uh, BBC production with my wife. I, I don't know where it came from, but it sounded so much like a uh, Jane Austen word. Uh, it just fit there. Uh, uh, particularly, I, I believe it's the landlord who says it, and, and uh, this large, uh, fairly uh, gruff landlord, it just seemed like a perfect word for him to say. Well, it sounds yeah. like it was as fun to write as it was to read. <laughs> we know you have to leave soon, Randall, but before you go, what can young writers learn from writers from the 1800s like Charles Dickens, William Thackeray, Wilkie Collins? It oh. seems for them a long time ago, but there are a lot of lessons that still Well, well remain. one thing that, that I've uh, learned from Dickens is that humor is universal mm -hmm. and timeless. Uh, it's the same with, with Shakespeare. Um, you listen to uh, scenes of Shakespeare, I'm particularly thinking of Dogberry and uh, Much Do About Nothing, the constable who, who sounds like a, a comedian nowadays. Uh, reading Dickens is the same. It's uh, the, the comedy, the humor is, is timeless. And, uh, and that's where I believe that that influenced the humor that we've uh, put into the Cheshire Cheese Cat. Um, also, the social themes mm -hmm. haven't changed much since Charles Dickens has, has written. Uh, there, there's still social injustice. There, there's so much we can learn uh, from, from those authors. My writing is very cinematic because I've grown up with movies. And, and when I write, I can picture a scene in my mind because I'm familiar with movies. Uh, authors in, in the 19th century didn't have that luxury uh, when they wrote. They wrote uh, using words as their tools, and uh, and that's uh, uh, I think partly why I have developed a love of words is from reading mm -hmm. uh, authors like that, like like Dickens. Thank you so much yes. for joining us on, via the internet. It's been great having you join us with Carmen today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Take care. Goodbye, Randall. Bye, Bye Carmen. Happy reading. <laughs> it's everybody. great seeing you, buddy. <laughs> you too. 
Carmen, tell us about the research that you did for this book. Oh, I was waiting for you to yeah. say, so was there any research? Any research? <laughs> was there any research? <laughs> about a year. Oh, my goodness. I know, I know. Where and do you even begin? Well, this is the part where mm -hmm. children do not go to sleep on me. Mm -hmm. Because there, when the word research comes up, a lot of mm -hmm. young people and adults will go, oh, no. Research just means reading and using the Internet and using the library and talking to people and interviewing them about something you absolutely love. So if you are just bonkers about, you know, World War II or World War I trench warfare, you can actually can't read enough about it. And um, it, it involves, you know, for us in this book, and it involved, I should say, finding a date and pinning it down, 1859, right? Who was alive? Bit from the big stuff to the little. Queen Victoria was on the throne. The Cheshire Cheese, what was going on there? Dickens was a part of it whole timeline of Dickens. How old was he? What was he working on? What was he writing? Uh, what were people eating? What was the coinage of the time? So, so we might have used the wrong coins. In fact, we used a very, 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 very wrong stamp. We had a penny black, and those of you that have read the book or may read the book, you'll find out that a stamp plays an important part in mm -hmm. this book. The penny black was not the stamp in 1859. It was the penny red. Who cares, you say? Ha <laughs> ha! About 100,000 philologists, those are stamp collectors, and I'm telling you, every single one of them would have sent us a letter with the appropriate postage telling us that we got it wrong. And then after it was all over, I found this on a rare book site, A History of the Old Cheshire Cheese, published in 1901. And I found it a month after the book was published. Carmen, we have a question from Aaliyah, and this is what she would like to know. My question is, what made Skilly not like to eat mice? And what caused Pinch to hate Maudlin? Hmm, those the are two, two good, good questions. questions. Very good questions. Skilly, if you remember, was born in uh, a dairy, in a, in a mm -hmm. workhouse, but he lived all around cheese and cream and other mm -hmm. things. So they were the first things he was introduced to. Why was he so averse to eating mice? Um, I'd like to think he was just wired that way. That was just his personality. Yes, that's but, right. And the other question that Aaliyah wanted to know was what caused Pinch to hate Maldwin? Well, if you remember, now Pinch is really, Pinch is a, has mm -hmm. a very different kind of wiring. And Pinch, Pinch had a very unfortunate childhood himself. He lived with a very cruel mm -hmm. man who he was very happy to see hanged. And for some people, cruelty can make them kinder. Others, it makes them cruel themselves. Mm -hmm. He is a, 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 a raven, a bird, a mouse would be a, a cat's natural enemy anyway. Remember that Maldwin has fallen into mm -hmm. the alleyway behind the inn when Pinch and his band of cats see the raven. So they attack him. And the reason that he is so almost obsessively, insanely possessed of this desire to destroy Maldwin is because for one thing, Maldwin took part of his eye. And if you read through it mm -hmm. again carefully, Maldwin in defending himself, because actually one raven against one cat, a raven will win every time. If you've never seen a tower raven, and I have, they are this big. And they are frightening, and they are carnivores. Mm -hmm. And they're very highly intelligent. Um, so he's out to finish what he started. He, was, he had meant to kill Maldwin. Maldwin was saved by Nell. When he finds out Maldwin's in the inn, he's going to finish him off, or at least he thinks he is. That's well, a good question. It's an absolutely good question. Great Thank questions. you, Aaliyah, for writing in. Well, in Spanish and English, would you give some advice to those budding writers that are watching today? Oh, I would love to. All right, Spanish and English. Well, actually, very brief. Okay. Um, en español, niños, niñas, jovencitos, jóvenes, si quieren escribir, una de las cosas más importantes es la lectura. El escritor, la escritora, lee, lee día y noche. Es lo más importante. Children, as an author, I would tell you that before I was ever a writer, I was a reader. And the most important thing you can do to become a good writer is to be a great reader. Good luck with that. See you in the library. <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs> oh, de nada. <laughs> you are quite Carmen, welcome. thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so much I fun having it. you back. It. it really has. Thank you. And my, my friend loved being here. Absolutely. I'm glad he could join us as well. You and thank now? you for watching. In the coming weeks, we welcome authors William Joyce and Brandon Mull to our series. I hope you can join us. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. So long for now. Thank you.